anticipated on showing this. So I went and added some comments that would help. <laughs> uh, so what we, had, what we did in the beginning, besides everything, uh, when you guys registered uh, with that key, though, we got all your information. Um, and we put that in the spreadsheet. We also put the rest of the people in the spreadsheet, so speakers, sponsors, us organizers, the folks who have been helping out with the audio and visual stuff, and um, Michael for running. Uh, so we have a big spreadsheet. So what I did when I created the badges, I took that spreadsheet, I gave everyone a unique number, I turned that into a binary number, and I associated that with you guys. So uh, and the reason I did that is because when we're at the Utah Ruby Group meetings, we have nine people, uh, and we do the binary lottery. We can have you know one of 16 outcomes, and so sometimes we draw someone who doesn't exist. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to give everyone a unique number, and then what I'm going to do is just randomly choose one of these. So here's the YAML file that runs this. You got your name, um, whether or not you're eligible. So, uh, so for example. So when we give away the X, the X box, this is uh, Tim Hewer, he's a Microsoft rep. I'm going to go ahead and turn him eligible to false. So he doesn't have his own X box. And then I'm going to go down and make sure that I'm eligible here on the bottom of the X box. Um, I'll, I'll turn the rest of you guys off. And I'll make sure that um, and, yeah, so the, I, I added all the organizers at the very, very end. Um, but for the most part, you're in the sequence of when you registered. So the amount of number was the first one to register. Um, so I <coughs> split, that, I split that up. I also split up the files that um, we created the badges from to make sure that everyone's in sync. And then, uh, it's really ugly script. Um, it's shanky. <laughs> um, and also, the other thing, um, the last talk, I, I wanted to do a RubyConf new kind of logo thing for the, the website. But I really wasn't sure. I didn't think that Mountain West Ruby Comp got me. It was, just seemed kind of a bad choice. And I thought giving the region as an optional parameter was bad as well. But I really like uh, James Britt's uh, way of doing that. So I'll use that for next year for 2008. Um, the biggest thing I think that people like is the, the big text. That's using Piglet, which is just a Linux command that you can install. Go to piglet.com or .org and get it. Um, and I just did that just to wrap all the Piglet calls. So that's big. I open the user file on here. I randomly choose a winner, and I make sure that it's, they're eligible. And if they're not eligible, then we randomly choose another one. And then I'm just going to take that winning number, <coughs> number and I'm just going to you know, show one at a time to build the suspense. That's all this loop is doing. Uh, I don't know. Do self-explanatory. I think you can understand that. And then uh, I just show the winner, and that's about it. After the winner's shown if they're here, um, I ask a question of what they got. I'll type it in. Um, and then if there's a value to that, we'll go ahead and save it to the YAML file and turn them to not eligible to win again. If not, then they'll, we won't save the file and they'll be eligible in the room. Um, so that's it. So multiple customers can have the same applications. I and mean, then you just 
every application is in a folder. You can just move an application from one installation to another, and the application runs. The design is all done with CSS. There's really no HTML except for one file where you do special weird things. The, so the, design is, uh, the designer basically has access to the CSS and programmers and everything else. Um, because I hate HTML, but all my customers want HTML. So. Um, you only retrieve and save the data you use. So unlike Active Record, where you pull all the data and send a whole bunch back, we deal with huge data sets and things. So we only pull the fields we want. And we only send back the fields that have been changed. It's a complete REST architecture. Everything is get and post. And it can act as a database in it for eight formats. Uh, and you can start it and stop it with wax on and wax off. <laughs> OK. So the development is uh, the developers do almost everything, and the designers do the CSS. Field position and order and everything is all done by the developer. Uh, this is how it works. You basically have a request that comes in on app.fcgi. It creates a request object. The request object creates a response object. It goes to the handler, which is like the controller. The handler creates these interfaces. An interface is an interface to a data source. And it has, feed, it has data objects, like a person, a company. And then the data objects have field objects, like first name, last name, company name. And the, the interface is responsible for inter interfacing with the database. And then those the interfaces get passed to the layout, and the layout gets rendered by the handler. And you can, have, you can actually have multiple layouts that get aggregated into one layout that the end user uh, actually sees. So the handler, basically, the request comes in. The request is an instantiated object. It's not a class. And so it, you can have multiple requests. You can fork out requests and do crazy things like that. So the, the very first code you write is the stuff in blue, death record, handle, and it comes from there. The interface, you, you extend either a Postgres or a MySQL or, or and some XML remote data source or whatever you want. You define all the fields on that um, data object are created. And then you define the fields that are on this interface in an array. So in this case, we have these five fields, two data objects, a person, and a company. Then you define the sort order if you're getting a list of data, the default sort order. Uh, if you pass in search in the URL of something, you specify what fields are searched. If you pass in a field name, like first name equals Dan, it'll look for the, in the first name field for that value, and you can do all kinds of matching options, whether it starts with contains case sensitive greater than equals to. You can specify whether search criteria are required. Uh, on the data coming back in, you validate on your interface to say on this interface this field is required, and then you can do complex validation, like if it's a if it the country is in the U.S. and the state is required. You don't know, time to okay. Ready? Don't blink. Okay. So the field has a whole, it has 97 attributes, and you have these are different field types. This is Ruby, and the these these interface uh, data formats XML. All those ones up there. It does all those automatically, and then you can write your stuff. So here's this is how you set field attributes, and we're gonna look closely here. So here's all the code for one interface. You got a handler, an interface with a couple things required at the bottom there. The data has some field types. I suggest. Okay, and then the result is in the middle. You got your HTML. The left over there is a JSON. JSON, and you can input. You can get and post all of these things. There's so XML. You can get and post Excel files. So here's a select field. You just say the type is suggest. I mean, this is a suggest. You give it a URL where this data comes from. It pops up this drop down menu from that URL of data. That's tabbed into the data that gets turned into this. 
this is a list a list view it has paging at the bottom which is grayed out because it's not enough all the all the table column headers are sortable backwards and forwards and the search when you put in the search field it searches those fields that you define in the interface to be searchable that's it Jay? All right, so my name is Jay Meskill. Uh, I work for a company called Inter Integrum Technologies in Phoenix, Arizona. And here's my uh, short demo. Managing SSH keys with Capistrano, or how my life is easier thanks to James Buck. So what, uh, what the problem that, that we had is uh, we have a bunch of uh, Zen DOM use that a bunch of our developers need access to to, depl to uh, deploy uh, prototype applications for our clients. Um, we needed a way to quickly add and revoke uh, different developers' keys, kind of across the board. You know, not not the not the most uh, secure system, but it's it's only for our internal prototyping work. So my solution was to make it cap deployable. I'm just going to take you guys through my recipe real quick. And uh, oops. and then I'll show you uh, a working sample of just deploying it to my own machine. Uh, so this is your basic Capistrano recipe. Uh, we're finding the server that I'm going to deploy it to, which is my machine here. Uh, the user, I'm going to deploy it to the SSH demo directory so that I don't screw up my own SSH keys. Um, if we look at the setup, you know, standard stuff. Um, in update code, since we're not using uh, subversion or any sort of source control management, I'm overriding that task. Using it to collect um, whatever files are in the keys directory, so that would be, you know, multiple developers' public keys, and uploading that into the authorized keys file. Uh, after the symlink, I'll link uh, the, the authorized keys from the, the current release into the SSH directory so that now we have public key management. So I'm just going to run this real quick. Let's see. Here's my SSH demo directory. If we look, there's nothing in it right now. So I'm going to run a cap setup. We should have a releases and now a so uh, let's see. Let's look in the keys. So I've got two different keys here that, that I've collected. They're both they're both my own, but we'll go from here. So uh, I'm going to run a cap deploy, and that's going to go through, concatenate those files together, and deploy it to the authorized keys file in my SSH demo. So if this were a server that was running, we'd deploy it to the SSH directory. Now my developers can deploy applications. SSHN for remote management, et cetera, et cetera. And that's pretty much it. All right, well, I'm trying to figure or find my displays. My name is Kobe Rehnquist. I would have a company here in Salt Lake, and we do custom application development for our clients. And one of the pieces that we started getting into Ruby on Rails and doing work and building internal applications for our clients, um, when we first got started, it's like, we're going to close this. We'll just tuck it out of the way. <laughs> so we do custom applications. And Rails is great. It gives you this wonderful application development framework. Well, what I found is it leaves right there where you're ready to start the application, it drops off. Um, so after doing a bunch of research, I came across a product or a project called Goldberg. Uh, it's basically a generator. I have nothing to do with the project other than being a uh, diehard consumer of it. So we're going to start with a tr traditional command. We're going to create a Rails application. It's not to watch Ruby conference. I uh, already went in and created a database. So once we have that create the app created, we've all done this in Rails before. We can go to our script server, flip over to our refresh, and you get what you see every time you start up the brand new Rails app. That was nice, but it's not quite as far as I wanted the thing to go for us. 
So after finding Goldberg, you can take it a step further. And I've got to, I've just downloaded and installed the Goldberg generator in my generator's directory. And now I can do Ruby script, if I can type correctly, generate Goldberg. And with Goldberg, it comes predefined with a couple of different templates. We'll use the snooker template. It runs the generator, sticks a bunch of files in here, and then at the end it tells you to go ahead and run rake Goldberg install. But basically all this does is execute uh, the migrations that the Goldberg generator created as a your project and then populates the database with some default data. Okay, now that that's ran, the, I just switched tabs here to just uh, start the server up. Ruby script server, I think the server's running. We refresh and now we get a little bit more complete site. We've got a nice pop down men or drop down menus. We've got a login that's created users, it's created basic security and authentication. And we can log in as admin. It also adds a basic CMS to the application. So now once we log in as administrator, we can come into setup. And the first thing that got me is you have this thing called controllers and actions. And it shows up and lists. Those are all of the Goldberg controllers that have generated and stuck in your application. So if we come back over here and we just do a typical Ruby script, generate controller, we'll call it search and generate the index method. Okay, it creates our new search controller. If we come back to the controllers and action screen in Goldberg and hit refresh, we get a little bit different screen. Goldberg has gone out and looked at our source code and realized that we've created a controller that doesn't currently exist in the system. So it promises that. Click on it, it allows us to add it and set a default permission. I'm going to leave the permission in the administrator and tell it to create it. So we now have the controller we just created. We've assigned it a default set of permissions. And then we're going to select that and we're going to add an action. So you have the action we're going to use is the one we created for index. And we're going to create that. So now we've added the controller and the action to the Goldberg definition. The next step to getting that onto the menu is we come to our menu editor and it gives you a nice little hierarchy of menu preview. We're just going to add this right on the top. We're going to add a new menu item called search. And the label is search and it's going to run against a controller or action that we've defined in the database with security permissions. So we hit create ads on the menu. You'll notice it does show up up here on the menu. You hit search and you get your default scaffolding that we generated that said where to find the view. So instantly your scaffolding stuff that you build has a place to live. Now if we log out, because I set search up as an administrator only, we log out, search goes away. Log back in, search shows back up. Um, the other piece I wanted to show you real quick is it also has a basic built-in CMS. So you can go to content pages. These are the pages that Goldberg defines by default. You can go to your home page. And this is actually straightforward enough that I actually give my clients access on their websites to maintain their own static pages. Come down here, you can change the name, and it's very as well as setting the permissions for the page. So anything you create in the CMS is also able to have security applied to it. Uh, this is currently using textiles. So this is textile and market by default through the red cloth libraries. Add more stuff to the page. Save it, go to the home page, and it's there like you'd expect it to. So Goldberg just gives me the extra step of going from I have an app and I got to build a whole bunch of stuff to I now have an app that's got built-in users, roles, permissions, and the ability to set roles and permissions on controllers and pages. So Goldberg's just been a fantastic boom or boom to the stuff that we do with our company and with our clients in taking you from having the framework that Rails is to having a pre-built application and because it's a generator. You have all the advantages that you can modify the heck out of it and not worry about it. You have the disadvantage of it's a generator, so when there's a new release, or you go to Rails 1.2 and you go to the version of Goldberg that's compatible, you get a reduce some code. So Goldberg's been a great tool for us. You can find it at goldberg.rubyforge.org.
which here we're getting all the Java permission here because it's actually running within a VM. But if we take a look at our Glassfish application server here, uh, take a look at our web applications, we actually have an JS. Uh, the way we get this, I won't run this completely through, but basically just a plugin that goes in the Rails app, war, standalone, so it's got all the libraries and dependencies it needs, create. And what this will do is it will go through and first of all, pull in a bunch of Java dependencies, pull in things like JRuby and other stuff, uh, add the Ruby standard leg, and it'll go through and then also pick up the uh, Rails gems and a few other things, add them into the WAR file. I won't let it continue because there's a lot of files that have to copy the first time. But the result is that you get a, let's see here, um, there, yeah, an fjs.war <coughs> file. And that's all that really comes out. Uh, and it does keep track of it, so it'll only do the big copy one time and just update what it needs from then on. But once you've got that, you can go to whatever app server. There's lots of people doing it on Glassfish and JBoss and Tomcat and a bunch of others. All you have to do is go to the location. That brings it up. And the advantage to this, obviously, is you have one server process for as many Rails apps as you want, as many concurrent requests as you want. Uh, we have actually better database support than Rails does at this point, because we have JDBC, which supports everything. And uh, I guess that's, uh, that's about it. 1.0 Rails integration. Check it out. Try it on an app server. Do what you want with it. There you go.
seconds. Um, I can also, although I'm not showing any of these patterns, depend on another kind of pattern already having been seen within a set period of time. Um, a name for the type of pattern, and then the regular expression that actually gets matched for it. And once they see three or four of these, a junior says, yeah, you can sit down and write one very, very quickly. Um, the results that we got, uh, like I said, it's about 250 lines of code, not counting the catalog. Um, it's really, really easy to define. It's like eight lines of YAML. Um, I can handle 2,250 log entries per second. Um, we currently throw something on the order of 75,000 every 20 minutes. So it's taking me like half a minute to process 20 minutes to report the log entries. Uh, so I've got plenty of room for growth. If it really gets big, it could simple enough. I'm just going to throw DRB in it and spread my processing across a bunch of boxes. Um, and finally, there's another small review in inside the organization, which is always a good thing. Questions? How long was that? <laughs> I forgot to turn it on. <laughs> How long was it? How many breaths did you take? Uh, four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the new code. It was 275 seconds. That's what this says. <laughs> So here we go. Uh, the new code's a little bit more involved, but it's still not terribly involved. Easy to write, easy to read, easy to maintain. That's why I'll make a movie. It's 